Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today I'm going to explain what a phase modulator is and how it can be used in fiber optics. So essentially a phase modulator is very similar to an electric op optical modulator that we discussed in a previous video. Only this time it doesn't have two split tracks, it only has a single track. So you send light into one port, it goes through a particular kind of crystal and then it goes to the other port. Now this crystal has some special properties that if you apply an external electric field to it, then its refractive index changes. Which means that if you apply a higher, higher voltage here, then the phase of the light will be delayed more and more. And I guess more interestingly is that if you apply, let's say, a phase that varies over time, then the phase of the light will get varied over time. So you can imagine sending in purely monochromatic light, which is a single optical frequency going in, and then the phase of the light sort of gets shifted backwards and forwards. So here it gets extended a bit, here it gets compressed, as you can see. And then you have sort of um, a phase modulated signal coming out. Now one really important thing to keep in mind is that when you send light into a phase modulator of this particular type, then you have to make sure that it's purely polarized. So you have to make sure that you have some kind of device out here that cleans up the polarization and ensures that it's only in either this direction or I guess perpendicular to it in order to make sure you get a sort of clean output. So anyway, let's see how we can actually use that in an experiment. So in this little setup I've sketched here, we first have a laser that we want to test. We then, oh I should probably mentioned that we have a polarizer here. So we clean up the polarization, send it into a phase modulator that's being driven with a, um, an external um, function generator. So it's going to be a sinusoidal phase modulation this one acquires. This then gets sent into both um, a regular grading-based OSA down here, but also into the high-resolution OSA that we discussed in a previous video. So let's go take a look at that. Now actually, before we move on to the experiment, I should probably explain what we expect to see on the high-resolution OSA here when, uh, when this gets out. Because clearly we can see that somehow the phase here is changing over time, so this indicates to us that new frequency components have been introduced by applying this sinusoidal phase modulation. So let's actually try and sketch out the incident electric field here using the complex formalism. So this is probably how the... So this is basically how you can describe the electric field coming in. So how do you explain the electric field coming out? Well, it's essentially identical to the incident field, except for an additional phase modulation here, which we can write as a complex exponential of i. And let's call this phi a for the phase amplitude, so that's the maximum phase delay that it acquires, multiplied by cosine of the driving frequency times t, like so. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So we have a complex exponential with a sine function or cosine function inside. So this seems a little bit strange to put you know, a cosine function inside of a, another cosine function. But essentially what you can use is something called the Jacobi Anger expansion. And this is a way to write this kind of structure with a cosine inside of a complex exponential as an infinite sum of individual complex exponentials. So basically, we're going to say that this exponential of E by A cosine of omega D times T is equal to an infinite sum from negative infinity to infinity of i to the n. Then we have a function of j n of phi a multiplied by e to the i n omega d times t like so. Okay, so this particular type of function in here is called a Bessel function that you may be familiar with if you have solved the wave equation in a sort of radial, radial system. And essentially, if we, if we think about it, if we sketch it out, then the initial field we have up here is going to look something like this. We just have the, the frequency here, and then we have a single laser line right there. Maybe we'll give it a bit of width, like so. So what do we have coming out here? Well, here we see the field is essentially a... Um, so we have this e to the negative i omega t multiplied onto this. So what we get out is essentially the original line here in the middle. But then we also get these frequency sidebands here. So you can sort of imagine that everything's centered around this carrier frequency omega. And then we have um, additional frequency line spaced n times omega d away from it. So here we have a distance of omega d in frequency space, and this is another omega d we have here. So we can label these, let's say that's 0, 1, 2, and this is negative 1, 2, based on the index of this, uh, this n here. So the point is that if we take the setup and apply sinusoidal phase modulation, then we should go from having a single frequency component coming in to having multiple frequency components coming out with these, um, with the spacing equal to the driving frequency and relative strength that depend on the magnitude of this, this modulation. All right, let's go see that in action. 
Okay, so here we see the practical experimental setup. We have a DFB laser being driven by the, the device up here. And this laser light goes into, first of all, a um, polarization beam splitter in order to clean up the state of polarization. Here I'm not really bothering to make sure that we have maximum power on this one, because we have more than enough for this particular configuration. But in principle, you could put another power meter here, and then adjust the polarization here until you get minimum power out of this one, and the maximum power out of this one. Anyway, so now we know we have a clean state of polarization, it's only along the vertical or horizontal direction. We then send this into a phase modulator, which so I might be able to pop over the lid here for me to show you the device. There we go, so you can see it looks very much like other fiber optic devices you might see, it's just a, a box with an input and output, and a secured in place with these, uh, this really advanced uh, engineering, as you can see. So anyway, this output goes into the, the copper here, I'm sending one of these into the normal grading based OSA over here, another one into the high resolution OSA here. And the phase modulator itself is being driven actually with the same device that we used for the um, acoustic optical modulator in the line width video. So go check that out if you want to learn more about laser line width. So when I press this button, it generates a sinusoidal electrical signal, which then drives the um, phase modulator here and then advances and delays the phase of the incoming light signal in a sinusoidal way. Now, crucially, I've also installed a, an attenuator right here that I think it's a 30 decibel attenuator just to make the output a little bit more simple and we'll see what happens when I remove this in just a bit. So let me plug in my camera here. Maybe I'll actually focus it down here first of all so you can see the screen. And I'm going to turn on the laser. You should see it appearing. There we go. So let's give it a moment to stabilize a bit. And then I'm going to turn on the phase modulation here. You'll see over on this screen here, we don't see any change really. Like it's basically the same signal. So I'm going to turn it off and turn it on. And there's really no change here. And essentially, the reason is that the uh, driving frequency of 200 megahertz is way too small to be resolved with this um, with this OSA because the, the grading causes these like very even a very loud laser to appear like a, a wide like smeared out spot here. But let's see what happens if I go to the high resolution OSA and then try the same thing. So let me just find the signal somewhere. Looks like it drifted a bit out of the range. Oh, here it is. There we go, that's perfect. And let me reduce this to 200. So right now, again, you can see I've actually changed the setting on the OSA here compared to the previous video. Before it was measuring wavelength, now it's measuring increments of frequency. And there we go, it's still stabilizing a little bit, so let's give it a while to, to maybe settle down here. Oh, it keeps drifting. That's a little bit inconvenient, but it should go back in place in a moment. Let me actually increase this a little bit more so we can keep track of it. So 400. And there we go. So hopefully this is going to be stable in just a moment. So anyway, when I press this button up here, we should be able to see that this splits into frequency sidebands. And because each of these boxes here has a width of 400 megahertz, we'd expect that a new frequency line appears every half a box. So let me turn it on now. And there we go. So you see that we get a new frequency line appearing every every 200 megahertz here because that's the driving frequency of the um, of the uh, the RF signal. So it's still drifting a little bit. Let me just move it again so we can keep up with it. There we go. Okay, so maybe while this is settling down, I will actually try to remove that attenuator I showed you earlier. Just to see what happens if we have a really, really strong signal. Oh, Jesus. Actually, I just touched the, uh, the attenuator and noticed it has a, a huge, um, it's actually really hot to the touch. I think it's dumping quite a bit of power inside of this, this thing right here. Maybe I should uh, be a bit careful with putting too much power into this thing here. Alright, so maybe I'll plug this in here and then show what happens when I turn the, the driver back on. One, two, three, go. So now we see a huge, huge range of outputs here. So essentially what's happening here is that the driving is so so high, like the phase amplitude, phi A is so large that all of the vessel functions that are inside of that expression get excited and we get this really huge number of frequency lines coming out. And I think it's even large enough to kind of see over on the other also right here. If I turn it off, you can see that it switches to this kind of look and if I turn it back on, it now looks like this. So as you can see, this, um, 
type of phase modulator is actually really useful for a lot of experiments in, in fiber optics because you can um, generate more frequency components by using RS signal. It's possible to take in a single laser uh, and then actually shift it by a certain amount, either to higher frequencies or lower frequencies. That might be useful for experiment. You can also, uh, as I said, like advance or delay the, the phase. You could even modulate it in a more sophisticated way, way where instead of using a so a certain electrical signal, you can use like a triangular ramp or maybe like square pulses or something like that, depending on your applications. You're still going to get sidebands out of that, but the relative strength and the relative phases will be a little bit different. So anyway, I hope that the video was interesting. I'll see you in the next one. Before I go, I should probably mention that if you're actually planning on using um, a phase modulator in your fiber optic experiments, it's probably best that you don't use a function generator like the one I just showed you, because that's technically not designed for, B, for driving phase modulators. Uh, instead, you should probably use something like this, which is like a, a proper specialized um, function generator that can have like, multiple like, um, frequencies you might be interested in. This one goes from 10 megahertz all the way up to 40 gigahertz, so it's quite a high quality instrument, although I think it is probably a legacy instrument that's quite a few years old at this point. Uh, yeah, you can see that this one was uh, last calibrated back in 2000, 2002, so it's already a pretty old device. So anyway, the way you'd set it up is that you'd take the RF output here and plug it into the phase modulator right right over here. And you may also want to possibly install a, an amplifier right here. So these are devices that you can, uh, of course, purchase off the, the market and they might require some kind of um, driving voltage. So this one goes from ground and needs a ground and also I think six volts here. So it's just a matter of hooking that up to an appropriate uh, voltage supply right here. And uh, you should be good to go. All right, I'll uh, see you in the next video.